Hey everybody, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. Uh, this is a laboratory video. We're going to be going over the anatomy of the bones of the upper extremities and the pectoral girdle. So if you're following along on your list of things to know, we are going to be on page 20 and we're going to be following in order of the bones. I may not do all the structures in the order that they're listed, but we will do the, the bones in the correct order. So the first thing we're going to start with today is what we call the pectoral girdle. Now the pectoral girdle is the group of bones that make up your collarbone and your scapula on both sides. So you can see how the collarbone would fit here in the front. You can see how the scapula sits on the back and the humerus or upper arm bone would make your shoulder joint. So these two bones are part of the four bones that make up what we call the pectoral girdle, named for the pectoral region. So, we're going to be covering these two bones uh, in all their detail and then move on to the rest of the arm. Now, we have two clavicles here. The clavicle is your collarbone and they are mirror images of each other. So, we have two scapulae here and they're mirror images of each other. Now, it's very often important to know if you have the right one or the left one or if you're looking at the superior, inferior, medial, or lateral part of the bone because of the way certain structures are named. So when it comes to the clavicles, when you get a chance to hold them, if you look at them, one end is much more rounded and the other end is very flat. If I grab them, I have a rounded end and I have a flat end. The rounded end is going to attach to what we call the sternum. And so the rounded end of the bone is called the sternal end. Okay, or the sternal extremity. The flattened end, which actually has sort of a little hook to it, is called the acromial end because it's going to attach to a structure on the scapula called the acromion process or the acromion. They fit together somewhat like this. So, rounded end is the sternal end. The flattened but hooked end is called the acromial end or they're also called the sternal extremity and acromial extremity. One clue is the acromial end has a slight hook to it, sometimes referred to as the acromial hook. If I look at the acromial end and I rub my finger on it, on the top it's very smooth, but on the bottom there's a little bit of a point that sticks down. So if this is lateral and that point put, goes down, this would be my right acromion, okay? So um, sometimes on the exam we will ask you to include right or left in the name. So there's three things you should know. One of them will be identify the bone. If we ask on a lab test to identify that bone, that means the whole thing. The answer would be clavicle. You do not have to say clavicle bone, just say clavicle. If we ask you to identify the structure or the end, that would be the, the sternal end or sternal extremity. If we ask you to identify this structure or part of the bone, this would be called the acromial end. That's it. This, should, this bone should not take very long to learn. Now the second part of the pectoral girdle is going to be the scapulae. Um, I have the right scapula and the left scapula here. We're going to focus on the right scapula for now. Okay. So now, if you notice, there's all these bumps sticking off on one side and it comes to a point. This point's in the inferior direction, so this is sometimes referred to as the inferior angle or inferior border. This would be the superior border of the bone. Not all of the structures that, my name, that I am naming are on your list. For example, these point always laterally. This is where you make your shoulder joint with the humerus here. And so this would be lateral and this would be the medial edge. And these are referred to as the lateral margin and the medial margin of the bone. But we're not learning those parts. I just want you to be able to tell if it's the right one or the left one. If this is inferior and this is superior and that's lateral, this would have to be the right shoulder blade. It would sit on my back like this, okay? So here are the parts that you need to know. If I look at the bone this way, if I held it between my hands, almost like I were praying, one side, there's not a lot blocking my hand from sliding off. On the other side, it hits this large ridge that runs across here. That ridge is referred to as the spine of the scapula, also called the scapular spine. Some books will say scapular spine, some will say spine of the scapula, and some will simply call this the spine, 
okay? If I run my finger along the spine, it ends, it flares out in this big flat end right here. That large flat structure is called the acromion, also called the acromion process, okay? So that's the acromion or acromial process, okay? Now, spine, acromion process. If I jump across a little gap here, this little pointy piece sticking out is called the coracoid process, coracoid. Coracoid, C-O-R-A-C-O-I-D, coracoid process is, the coracoid means um, crow's beak. And if you look at it, it kind of looks like a little bird's head with a little beak sticking off right here. And that would be the wing of the bird. So that's the coracoid process. So spine, acromion process, coracoid process. Spine, acromion process, coracoid process. Now, if I run my finger along the coracoid process, it falls off here in this little notch. That little groove or notch is called the scapular notch. So spine, acromion process, coracoid process, scapular notch. Now, if I look underneath those two processes, this little flat spot is where the head of the humerus sits. This is called the glenoid fossa. The whole structure is called the glenoid process, but the flat spot is called the glenoid fossa. I believe our list calls it the glenoid cavity, which would be the space between the bone, uh, between the two bones here. But this is called the glenoid fossa. So these are the structures you need to know. Spine, acromion process, coracoid process, scapular notch, glenoid fossa, and then this part is known as the subscapular fossa. There's a bunch of other things you could learn, like this is called the supraspinous fossa because it's above the spine, the infraspinous fossa, and you will see some of those terms when you move on to the next level of anatomy. But for now, here's how you should learn a bone. Say the name, scapula. Spine, acromion process, coracoid process, scapular notch, glenoid fossa. Now, those are the structures that you're responsible for for our lab tests. Anything else was extra just to fill you in, okay? Now, I'm gonna move on to the next bone, which is called the humerus. <clears throat> the humerus is your upper arm bone. And if I've stuck the two humeri next to each other, you would see that they are mirror images of each other, okay? So, we tend to learn one side of the body and then get confused when someone shows us the opposite side. So, sorry if I'm getting my head and my back in your way here, but, you know, I'm doing the best I can. So, if I look at these two bones, this rounded part is the proximal end of the humerus, and then all these little bumps with these little divots would be the distal end of the humerus. Now, in order to make your shoulder joint, notice that the head does not sit straight up. It leans to one side. Whichever side it's leaning to is going to be medial because it's got to make a joint with this bone. Okay? So, if I know the head is on the medial side of the bone or pointing medially, everything on this side would be the medial edge and this would be the lateral edge. I'm gonna do the right humerus because I think that's the one that's in our lab manual. So, now if I look at the humerus, there's a little groove right here and there's two little bumps and another groove here. Those structures, I'm gonna mention them in case you see them in your future, but this is called the anatomical neck. These two bumps are called tubercles, and the groove is called the intertubercular groove. We're not gonna learn those. You do need to know that this is the head. Now, if I have my finger on the head, and I know this is all medial, if I run my finger over to the lateral surface of the bone and run it up and down, it's very difficult to see, but there's a little ridge right here, about a third of the way, a little bit more than a third, almost halfway down. That little ridge is called the deltoid tuberosity. Your deltoid muscle on your shoulder will attach there and pull. So we have the head. On the opposite side, we have the deltoid tuberosity. Now, if I continue to go down the same edge, 
Notice there's a little bump. It's not much, but there's a little piece that sticks out right here where my thumb is touching. And there's a little knot sticking out on the other, other side, but it's much larger and more well-defined. Those two bumps are called epicondyles. Epi means upper or outermost. And these two bumps can be referred to as condyles. Condyle is a nice smooth round bump on a bone. Since these are outside these two condyles, these are called the epicondyles. Do not confuse those terms. Now, since the head is medial, this one is called the medial epicondyle. And I think of it as being rather massive compared to the other one. It's massive and medial. This other little bump out here is called the lateral epicondyle. Now, the way my brain works is I like to try to run all the structures and repeat them in the same order in one direction. So what I did is I learned it this way, head, deltoid tuberosity, if I come all the way down here, this is called the lateral epicondyle. Now, if you look closely, the end of the bone has a rounded bump and it has this funky looking bump that has a groove and two points. The rounded bump looks like a smaller version of the head. In Latin, the word head is capitis. So, the ulum at the end of the name means little. Since this is the capitus, which is, would be the Latin name for it, this is called the capitulum or capitulum, okay? That rounded bump is the capitulum or the capitulum. It's pronounced capitulum. Now, the two bumps with the groove in the middle is a structure that looks like a pulley or a spool of thread. You can imagine um, some, a rope running right there like on a pulley or like a spool of thread. The Latin term for that is trochlea. It's spelled T-R-O-C-H-E-L-E-A, T-R-O-C-H-L-E-A, but it's pronounced trochlea. It looks like trochlea, but it's pronounced trochlea. That structure is this whole piece right across here. So I have the lateral epicondyle, I have the capitulum, I have the trochlea, and then I have the medial epicondyle, okay? Head, Deltoid tuberosity, lateral epicondyle, capitulum, trochlea, medial epicondyle. And repeat them until you can't stand it and becomes a rhythm. Head, deltoid tuberosity, lateral epicondyle, capitulum, trochlea, medial epicondyle. Finally, there's a little divot right above the trochlea on the front. I can barely fit my pinky in there. If I flip it over, it's so large that I can fit my whole thumb in it. That smaller little divot is anterior. If this is medial and this is anterior, then I would have the right humerus, okay? That little divot is called a fossa. And since it's coronal or frontal, it's called the coronoid fossa, coronoid with an N. That's the coronoid fossa, that little divot or depression. If I flip it over, this large depression or divot is called the olecranon fossa. Some people like to say olecranon, and you could say it that way. It helps you spell it correct, but it's pronounced olecranon fossa, okay? So, one last review. Head, deltoid tuberosity, lateral epicondyle, capitulum, trochlea, medial epicondyle, the coronoid fossa, and on the back side is the olecranon fossa. Now you can put those in any order that you like. You can do it however you like. My lab partner did it the opposite. Head, medial epicondyle, trochlea, capitulum, lateral epicondyle, deltoid tuberosity. But I like to go the other way because then I end up here and do my two fossae, okay? Head, deltoid tuberosity, lateral epicondyle, capitulum, trochlea, medial epicondyle, coronoid fossa, olecranon fossa. Again, just pick three or four, repeat them till you can't stand it, and then do it again. Do it till you get it, do it till you understand it, do it till you can do it from memory. Every time you finish a bone, by the way, you should be able to go back through the other bones and see if you can do all three. Loan one bone at a time. Clavicle, sternal end, acromial end. Scapula, spine, acromion process, coracoid process, scapular notch, glenoid fossa, humerus, head, deltoid tuberosity, lateral epicondyle, capitulum, trochlea, medial epicondyle, 
coronoid fossa, olecranon fossa. One last thing, and I'm going to wrap this video up, and then we'll do the lower arm. Look, I have the two opposite bones, head. That's the lateral epicondyle on the left one. This is the lateral epicondyle on the right one. So if you ever see the opposite bone, it's the mirror image. It's kind of like the thumb on one hand is on one side. On the other hand, it's on the other side. Okay. So don't be confused if we use the opposite bone. You have to be able to make sense of what's what. All right. Now, a few more bones to learn here. The next two bones are the bones of your lower arm. We have two bones in the antibrachium. One bone is on your thumb side. That bone allows you to rotate or radiate your wrist. So that bone is called the radius. And it looks something like this. It has a nice flattened, it's a round but flat head on one end. And it's got a little pointy thing on the distal end. And the radius will point to your thumb. I happen to have the right radius in my hand. Um, one way to tell which radius you have is on the, uh, on the anterior margin. It's rather smooth. On the posterior margin, it has these rough little bumps. And that's where the tendons of your fingers are guided through those little bumps back here and go to your fingers. So that's posterior. And this is proximal. So I could line it up with my arm and tell that I have the right radius. The other lower arm bone that sits medial to the radius allows you to flex and extend your arm. That bone is called the ulna, and it looks like this. The ulna has a U on the proximal end that screams ulna, and the distal end has a little point and a knot that points at your pinky. So you thumb a ride on your radius, thumb a ride on the radius, and you can remember pinky, Ulna, P-U, woo, stinks, P-U, pinky ulna. Anyway, now, here are the parts of the radius that you guys need to know, and then we'll do the ulna. The proximal end of the radius has this flattened but rounded looking head. By the way, the reason that is there is it fits on the capitulum like this and allows it to rotate. That's why there's a shallow depression there. This is called the head of the radius. Just below the head, the little skinny part is known as the neck of the radius. You could just say head and neck, okay? Or radial head and radial neck. Now, if I look at the bone and I rotate it on one side, just below the head and neck, there's a large bump that sticks off right here. Large, oddly shaped bumps are called a tuberosity. So that's called the radial tuberosity. Head, neck, radial tuberosity. If I go all the way down to the distal end, that little point is like a little needle that you could write with. If you speak French, it's un stylo, but a stylus means a needle, and that is called the styloid process. And it can be said three different ways, styloid process, radial styloid, or the styloid process of the radius, okay? So, um, not much to this bone for this class. We have head, neck, Radial tuberosity, styloid process. Head, neck, radial tuberosity, and styloid process. And just repeat it till you can't stand it and touch them. If you have the printouts, touch them and say them until you can do it from memory. Head, neck, radial tuberosity, styloid process. Head, neck, radial tuberosity, styloid process. When you're done with that bone, then we will add the ulna. Now the distal end of the ulna is called the olecranon, or some people say olecranon. That is the tip of your elbow. So the bump sticking up right here is a process. Anything sticking out of a bone can be referred to as a process. Since this is the olecranon, and this little tip sticking up is the olecranon process. Now the little tip on the front here is called the coronoid process, because it's coronal or in front. Olecranon process, coronoid process, just that little tip sticking up. The U-shaped structure between them is called the trochlear notch. And it's called that because it sits on the trochlea like this and allows you to flex. It's also why we have the coronoid process fits in the coronoid fossa so you can drink a corona. Not really something you wanna say during the coronavirus, but corona beer is still good. 
And then the olecranon process fits in the olecranon fossa that allows you to straighten your arm more, okay? So, coronoid fossa, olecranon fossa, coronoid process, olecranon process. Trochlea, trochlear notch. Now the trochlear notch is also called the semilunar notch because it looks like a half moon. Now, if I run my finger on either side here, if I look at this, there's a little bit of a carved out spot there and then it sticks out on the other side. That little carved out fossa is called the radial fossa or the radial notch, really. The reason it's called the radial notch is because the head of the radius fits there and when these two bones rotate around each other or when the radius rotates around the ulna, it rubs on that little spot. By the way, everywhere you have one of these really smooth surfaces is where we had some articular or hyaline cartilage. Anyway, so olecranon process, coronoid process, trochlear notch, radial notch. Olecranon process, coronoid process, trochlear notch, and the radial notch. Olecranon process, coronoid process, trochlear notch, radial notch. Now if I go down here, this is called the head of the ulna, which is not on your list, but the ulnar head or head of the ulna. But that little point is also called a styloid process. So we refer to that as the ulnar styloid, the styloid process of the ulna, or you could simply say styloid process. Okay, so by the way, if you look very closely on this model, you'll see that little line. That's called an epiphyseal line. That's where the growth plate was, called the epiphyseal plate or growth plate. But once it fills in with bone, your bones can't grow any longer. So they call that the epiphyseal line. And you can usually find them on the edges of bones if you look very carefully and your camera and lighting are good enough. All right, so. Those are most of the bones of the upper extremity. I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna do the hand and foot together and then we'll do the lower extremity and we're done with the skeleton. Now you got a lot of learning to do, so get started, don't mess around. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Do it till you can't stand it, do it till you understand it and then do it five more times till you can make an A. See you in the next video.